I'm a 33-year-old white female from Los Angeles. Three years ago, my boyfriend and I, as planned for five years, turned 30, sold everything we owned, including my car, took his trailblazer, and decided to just travel around the States and Canada. I guess you could call us backpackers, as we tend to chase good weather, find a state park, and backcountry hike into the wilderness for days at a time. My brother likes to joke that we're anti-establishment hippies. We don't necessarily live off the grid, but between the two of us, we have one prepaid phone which we use for emergencies or checking in with family and friends, and one MacBook which I use for work. I'm a freelance writer and content creator, and I'm on retainer with a robotics company. I mostly write boring white papers or web content. The whole point of our living situation is to live debt-free and have as few bills as possible. I only use free Wi-Fi, so one to two times a week we have to go to a city with a Starbucks. This background info is only really important so you know more about who we are and how simply we live. Neither of us is involved in social media, and we know very little of Reddit or Instagram, nor do we use any of those apps. Our phone isn't even a smartphone, and we don't even text. Last summer, we decided to do some backcountry hiking in Arkansas. It's one of those states that you don't really ever hear about other hikers visiting but we read that it had some beautiful natural landscape, and it does. The rules at this particular park were pretty relaxed. We didn't need a permit, and there were a few basic laws and guidelines, but no check-in was needed. We had all the basics and had planned to do a six-day hike, three in and three out. The whole time we were out there, we didn't see or hear another soul, but on day one, we were preparing to move off the trail and find a camping spot, as it was getting near dusk. One half mile off the trail is usually the standard for us. We took what looked like a kind of animal trail, and about half a mile out, we saw a green two-person tent. It was almost camouflaged in the foliage, so we came on it almost by accident. Some backpackers prefer privacy, while others are more social. We're the more social type. We've had some great experiences camping near other backpackers, sharing stories, food, and a joint or two. We were around 30 yards away from the tent. It was zip closed. So my boyfriend shouted a greeting to make our presence known. No movement and no sound. We assumed green tent guy either wasn't around or didn't want to be bothered so we started off in a new direction to get some distance between us. We camped and never heard a peep. We moved along the next morning, completely forgetting about Green Tent Kai, until nearing the end of day five on our trek back. We were again looking for a spot to camp off the trail, when we came up on the Green Tent again. This isn't that unusual, but normally backcountry hikers keep moving, so we weren't really expecting it. The tent flap was open, so my boyfriend yells his greeting again, and still nothing. He wants to go check it out, saying it's weird and maybe someone is hurt. I didn't like the idea from the get-go, because even though we hadn't had any bad experiences personally, we'd heard enough stories from other backpackers about hermits and mountain men that want privacy, carry guns, and those sorts of things but my boyfriend assured me we'd be fine, and if all else failed, to offer him some weed to keep the peace, and we'd go on our way. As soon as we get within 20 yards of the place, the smell of decomposition is intense. My boyfriend had been hailing his greeting over the last 20 yards, and once the smell hit him, he stopped and turned to me, and said, What if we find a dead body? My skin crawled and I was immediately afraid. I had never seen a dead body before, and I didn't want to. The closer we got to the tent, the worse the smell got. I knew for sure we were going to walk in and see some old camper's rotting corpse. 
and what we found was worse than that. Outside the tent was a dead doe's legs, all four of them, covered in flies. It looked like the legs had been cut most of the way, and then ripped off the rest. It was a mess. Inside was the body and head of the deer, but the middle portion was swaddled in a blue fleece blanket that was blood-soaked at the bottom where the legs used to be. It was laying on its side, bottom facing the tent entry, and the tail had been cut off and the anus slash vagina was covered in dried blood and a gape, like something had been penetrating it, and the same with its mouth. The bottom portion was bent down at a scary, broken-looking angle. The tent was open, so we could see everything without having to go inside. Not that we would have anyway, because at this point the smell was almost debilitating. And there was a dirty, almost empty clear bottle of Jurgen's baby oil, and a stained green and white fringed kitchen towel. And that was it. I immediately started crying and begged him to go. All he could muster was, What the fuck? And we turned and ran. We ran to the trail and jogged down it for as far as we could go, until dusk was fully on us and we had to set up camp. We didn't go very far off the trail and neither of us slept. We didn't start a fire or use headlamps after full dark. We just sat up whispering to each other, going over and over what we had seen. Every little noise startled us. It was like our brains were on run alert. I kept thinking that at any moment, the dead deer rapist would come back to his tent, see our footprints or something, know we were there, and track us back to our tent. I've never been so scared in my entire life. Just before dawn, we tore down and started out. My boyfriend stopped at the ranger station on our way out of the park to report what we had seen. And the ranger was a young guy around our age, and he looked as freaked out by our story as we were telling it. He wrote most of it down, and my boyfriend showed him on a map approximately where it had been. He asked if we knew how the deer was killed, and at that point we hadn't even thought about it. We just assumed it had been shot, but because of the blanket we didn't see a wound. We weren't exactly giving it an autopsy though. We've since shortened our backcountry hikes to a maximum of four days, and we've also been a lot less eager to call out to other campers. We've never approached another unmanned tent again. A couple of summers ago, my girlfriend and I were camping in Chowamagan National Forest in northern Wisconsin. After our experience, we don't plan to return unless we go with a large group of people. My girlfriend and I are from Chicago. So, northern Wisconsin was our go-to place for R&R. We've done a number of hiking trips in northern Wisconsin and in the UP, but never in this area. We're not backpacking experts, but we have been to a number of national parks, and have been out hiking and exploring when we can find time away from work. We love getting away from people and relaxing in nature, but this trip made us appreciate the presence of other people around us in unfamiliar places. Our plan was to hike a remote section of the North Country Trail. The North Country Trail is a national scenic trail, like the Appalachian Trail, but it gets much less use. In some parts of northern Wisconsin, the trail is very remote, and the only access is via logging roads. We plan to hike 15 miles along the trail to a backpack shelter, spend the night, and hike back to the car the following day. We spent the night at a friend's house in Wazau, and we set out early the next day to the trailhead. As we entered the National Forest boundary, we were captivated by the beauty of the thick green forests. I drove slowly along the gravel logging roads as we made our way out to our parking spot. While we were driving to the trailhead, we passed a couple of people standing next to a parked truck on the side of the road. They appeared to be hillbillies, as they had a rusted out, bunged up pickup truck, complete with Confederate bumper stickers. As we drove past, 
I waved, and they stared back without returning the greeting. Friendly people, I thought to myself. After we passed them, I looked in the rearview mirror and noticed they were still staring at us. And before we rounded a bend, I glanced back in the mirror again and saw them watching us through the haze over a road of dust. My girlfriend and I joked about the up north people, but we did not think anything of the encounter. Aside from those people, we didn't encounter anyone else on the remote logging roads within the National Forest boundary. We found the trailhead about 15 minutes later, after winding our way on the narrow logging road. And there was no one else parked at the trailhead. A perfect chance to get some needed solitude, fresh air, and relaxation. After parking and making sure the car was locked, we hoisted our packs and set off on the trail. The weather was relatively cool, which thankfully kept the mosquitoes and biting flies at bay. We took pictures along the way, and we marveled at the lushness of the forest and the topography of the glacial moraine. After a solid eight hours of hiking, we found our campsite. It consisted of a wooden backpack shelter and a fire ring. Even though the shelter provided ample space for us, we opted to set up our tent in a small clearing about a hundred feet behind it. We built a fire at the shelter fire ring, and I boiled water for our dehydrated trail food. As we ate, we watched the sky slowly turn dark. My girlfriend and I passed around a Nalgene filled with wine and we marveled at how many stars you could see away from the city. When the fire was reduced to a small pile of glowing embers, we decided to head back to the tent. We settled into our tent and looked through the pictures we took that day, but after lugging a heavy pack for 15 miles and drinking some wine, I was about ready for some shut-eye. When we camped at state and national parks, I usually wore earplugs, but that night, there were no RVs or other campers to make noise, so I closed my eyes and let the noise of the forest lull me to sleep. My girlfriend was very uneasy that night, but she normally had some apprehension whenever we were sleeping away from home. I am not sure when we drifted to sleep, but we awoke to a bone-chilling noise. It was pitch dark outside, and over the insects in the forest, I heard a dull thud. It sounded like someone was hitting two logs together. My girlfriend and I were wide awake at this point, and we lay silently in our tent hearing the noise again. Our old tent had mesh windows, but the backpacking tent we were using had no window. We could only guess at what was making the noise outside our tent. We initially thought that an animal got at our food and garbage bag, which we left in the shelter, but the noise was too distinct and it didn't sound like rustling through food wrappers or our camp equipment. Our hearts were pounding as we heard the persistent knock in the darkness. Unarmed and scared shitless, we didn't know what to do. I would normally have carried a can of bear spray, but I decided to leave it at home to save on weight against the wishes of my girlfriend. The knocking continued, but we remained still as to not give away our location. For all we knew, Whatever was making the noise had already spotted our tent. After what seemed like an eternity, the knocking sound ceased. We lay in complete silence with only the dull buzz of the insects in the background. But then we heard it. Leaves rustling. A branch breaking. Voices. We heard low talking in the distance. We couldn't make out what was being said, but it sounded like a couple of people talking in the distance. The voices continued for a bit, but to our relief, the voices didn't seem to be getting louder. Whoever was out there didn't spot the tent or had decided to leave us alone. We sat in our tent for the rest of the night, adrenaline surging through our veins. At the first light, we slowly got out of the tent. I looked around in all directions to see if anyone was there, but I only saw the forest and the backpack shelter. I quickly rolled up our sleeping bags and camp pads and put away our tent. When we got to the shelter, my girlfriend screamed in horror. On the entrance of the shelter, the wood was freshly cut. The word kill had been cut into the shelter wall, 
and there were a number of axe and knife cuts where someone was chopping into it. I looked at the ground and saw a scattering of fresh wood splinters. After grabbing our food supply and garbage bag, we got the hell out of there. We were nearly jogging with our gear as we made our way back to the car. I kept glancing back over my shoulder and gazing out through the woods to see if anyone was following us. We traversed the glacial eskers that we saw the day before, and we knew we were getting close to our car. We were quietly rejoicing as we neared the trailhead. We made it back to the trailhead in near record time, but something was wrong. The windshield wiper on my car was sticking straight up, and there was something stuck to the wiper. As we inched closer to the car, I saw there was blood smeared on the windshield, and a squirrel carcass was impaled on the wiper blade. Hair and blood still stuck to the wiper, and on the hood of the car. I didn't bother cleaning the car off. We threw our gear in the trunk, and I sped off without removing the animal from the wiper blade. As I sped down the gravel logging road, I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, but I couldn't see anything through the cloud of road dust behind the car. When we got to a gas station by the nearest town, I removed the carcass with a wad of newspaper, and I tried to remove as much dried blood as I could. I filled up on gas, and we didn't stop until we made it to Milwaukee. And this was the last trip I took to the woods of northern Wisconsin. This particular incident happened almost a decade ago, when I was maybe 10. I think I should stress before this that my parents really aren't pranksters. Even in regular social situations, where everyone's joking around and messing with each other, they usually get straight to the point. I have no reason at all to believe they were lying. It was the camping trip my dad had been looking forward to every day since the snow had melted into springtime. He'd requested a week off work late in June so that we could all go up to his favorite chunk of forest. And this state park was about an hour's drive away from where we live, and we'd do this thing as a family. We get set up on the campground, us two kids in one tent, my older brother and I, and my parents in another tent. And the first day goes great, and there's a lot of splashing around in the river, hiking, I've been a kind of chubby kid my whole life, so that part was less great. Doing fun family stuff. My brother and I rarely get along, but this is one of those rare moments that we enjoyed each other's company. Anyway, the sun starts to set, casting everything in gold, and then night finds the four of us sitting around the campfire making s'mores. I remember getting really spooked by all the noises in the distance and my parents were constantly telling me to calm down. They reminded me that there were other campers here. It was a state park after all, and this was the biggest time of year for campers. Also, there were no doubt lots of small furry animals like raccoons or squirrels or whatever running around out there in the darkness. This eases my nerves. For a moment or so, though, I could have sworn that I heard a very particular sound nearby. I knew that sound from all the games of hide-and-seek I'd played so often as a kid. It was the sound of someone trying to hold their breath, but being too excited to completely fall silent. I only heard it for a moment though, and then it was gone. The real event happened the next night. All four of us were in our tents, my brother fast asleep in the sleeping bag right next to me. I have a lot of body warmth on account of my chubbiness, so I had unzipped my bag and was just laying, staring into the darkness. I was trying to fall asleep to the soft lullaby of Mother Nature and whatnot, but it wasn't really coming to me. I reach over, and as delicately as possible, slip my brother's old phone out of his pillowcase where I knew he liked to keep it safe. I don't remember the time exactly, but it was early in the morning. Back when I was that age, I rarely stayed up after 10 p.m. I'm going to college, so obviously it's a different story now. Nearby, I heard a zipping sound. It was probably coming from my parents' tent, I figured. 
Thinking that somehow my dad knew I was awake, I quickly slipped the phone back into the pillowcase and fell back into a sleep position. Muffled footsteps, and the crunching of gravel, and the snapping of twigs, walked closer to our tent. They came to a stop right outside the tent flap. Dad? I asked after a moment, whispering as to not wake up my brother. Hey, I'm going to the bathrooms. Do you need to go too? The person outside the tent asked. Remembering that the bathrooms, that big building in the middle of the campgrounds that held the showers and the toilet stalls, were in the direction my dad was walking, I realized that I did have to pee. Yeah, give me a second, I replied quietly. So I quietly got up, stepped gingerly over my older brother, slipped on my flip-flops, and exited the tent. Sure enough, some ways down the gravel pathway that led to the bright light of the bathrooms was the big, bulky silhouette of my father. He was too far, and the light too glaring to see him clearly. I walked after him, shivering slightly in the wind. It wasn't exactly cold, but it was colder than inside the tent. I got to the bathrooms, and my dad was already in one of the stalls since I couldn't find him anywhere in there. I went into a stall and did my business as he exited his, and he left the building again without washing his hands. I finished up and followed after him. Dad, wait! I call whispered, picking up speed to catch up. The bulky silhouette waved a hand toward me, and headed to a completely different angle of the trees than we'd come. This confused me, and I stopped. Hey, come on, this is a shortcut, my dad said. I realized I'd never actually seen his face that entire night, so I got a little nervous. That's a stupid shortcut. I'm going this way, I said, and headed toward the actual direction of the campsite. They're over here right now. We're going this way, you little shit. My dad had never sworn at me before, so that's when the alarm bells really started ringing. I turned and ran as fast as I could, finding our camping spot and practically diving into my parents' tent. To my surprise, I found my parents playing cards under the light of a tiny electronic lamp. I asked my dad if he'd gone to the bathrooms at all that night, to which he replied no. My parents had woken up a few minutes beforehand by what they thought was a raccoon snooping around where our trash bag was outside the tents. And that's when they had decided that they couldn't really sleep, so they should play cards. I told them about what had happened, and my parents got out of the tent and searched the area, but they couldn't find anyone. To this day, they can't decide if there was actually a man trying to lure me into the dark forest, or if I just had a bad dream or something. I was a pretty imaginative kid back then, and knowing how my brain is better now, even I don't trust myself entirely to know what's the truth, or what was just my overactive imagination slash crumbling sanity. But one time while I was driving, I ran on red light, swearing up and down that I had been told for the last 18 years that green meant stop and red meant go. I remember going to the store wearing white socks with flip-flops, because my brother told me as I was walking out that I looked like an idiot. But as I was standing in the checkout line, I realized I didn't have socks anymore. Another time I triple checked to make sure my car was locked in a parking lot, and came back to find it unlocked, and my keys had disappeared from my pocket and were sitting in the driver's seat. I guess things happen like that sometimes. What's up guys, Blue Spooky here, as always. I just wanted to thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it to the end of the video here. If you liked the video, please feel free to leave a comment, or like and share if you feel so inclined. If you have any stories you'd like me to read, or any personal stories you'd like to send in, please feel free to take a look in the description below. There will be links to all of my social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and Gmail. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to include your story in a video as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please feel free to include in the tagline what the story is about, and how you'd like to be credited in the description of the video that this story appears in. 
If you have any constructive criticism, please feel free to leave it in the comments below, as I'm always looking for new ways to improve the channel. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.